Yes, you're my big potato, aren't you? Aren't you my big potato? I'm Marlisa with Little Crocus Modern Heirlooms, and I am so happy that you're here. It's co-COVID! <laughs> and I am thrilled to be part of it. Um, I would have been experiencing my very first time at Costume College, but unfortunately, other things happened. Other important things happened. So it is just fine that I am safe at home and that hopefully you are also safe and at your home. This video is about pretty much my most favorite thing, which is smocking in historical women's clothing. <laughs> hey, we all have our thing, right? <laughs> And I do want to put a couple caveats on this. Um, first, there are many Eastern European traditions of folk clothing and embroidery that look like smocking and probably when examined actually are what I term as the English smocking technique. But these regions are an area that I'm not overly familiar with, um, not with their cultural history or the meanings behind their styles or colors. And so rather than do them an injustice, I am just simply going to mention that many of these regions and communities have their own traditions of embroidery and smocking and clothing that are stunning and likely would be great fits within this video, but because I don't know enough about those cultures, I don't want to tread wrongly. So um, I encourage any of you to go and educate yourself on those various uh, regions and communities and traditional styles, uh, as I will myself be doing, and hopefully we'll do a video on them at another time. This is a brief overview. I'm giving examples of different times, of different types of garments that use the techniques of smocking. Um, this is not meant to be comprehensive in any way, but just to give you some, give you some context of how smocking entered the world of European Western high fashion, and maybe some of the ways in which these styles or techniques could be incorporated into modern garments or recreate the historical ones. And in the description box, I'll have a full bibliography of the garments mentioned, as well as appropriate credits for the images, whether they're from the website or something that I took myself. Also, any other people or podcasts or accounts that I might mention, I'll have them linked in the discussion box as well. And for those of you who are playing our virtual badge game, don't forget to hang around until the end of the video for the code to claim your badge for this video. So when we talk about smocking in modern days, that can mean a number of different things. I refer to as smocking is the manipulation of fabric, usually involving some type of stitch over or under the pleats of fabric. Um, this is a bishop dress that I made some years ago. You can see the gathering pleats are still in place. And this just means that um, a number of threads have been run in parallel through the fabric so that it can be drawn up in this uniform way. So this is what is traditionally going to be referred to as English smocking. Um, there are historical examples of this type of decorative surface smocking over the regulated pleats, but you also see 
some fairly loose uh, use of the term as well. Here is a historical example of English smocking. This is a adorable little dress uh, coat, kind of a lightweight coat that I picked up at an estate sale here in Birmingham based on the family um, of this estate, I'm aging this around the late 20s or 30s. And so underneath this lovely wide platter collar, you see the smocking here. And if you open up the garment, you can see there's also some smocking along the back. But um, if you see this as compared to our previous example, this fabric is not nearly as full. The pleats are not gathered as tightly. And then you have this stitching. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit for you. There you go. So then you can see um, this is just kind of a, a stitch, not, not the cable stitch um, that, that we're often taught to do today. Uh, which would be something more similar to this stitch where you go out on the left side of the pleat and go in on the right side of the next pleat. This is really just more of kind of a whip stitch. And um, oh, it looks like maybe a flow or something, but a very shiny thread. So this is quite loose. This is really more structural than decorative in its design, especially since it's meant to be covered up by this collar but overall very typical of what you see in um, antique children's garments. So this is a blouse that I picked up back in 2001 in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, before I was even interested in smocking and embroidery. So it's kind of fun that I have this in my collection now. Um, it was very much made for the tourist market um, and representative of that typical or stereotypical Hungarian folk style. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that except to mention that uh, you do see this, this tourist <laughs> trade actually show up in various historical garments. Um, you can actually find some dresses uh, from back in the 1920s that are that peasant style top um, with the, the smocking, the cables the way they are here. And, and you'll even see the note saying made in Eastern Europe for the tourist market. So it's quite interesting um, that that is something that exists as opposed to an uh, authentically original garment. So now that I'm opening up the inside, you can see um, the, the gathering threads have been taken out, which is appropriate. Um, and the smocking has been completely worked on the surface, this network of cables and waves. Um, so as opposed to some of our later modern examples, uh, there's no back stitching here or elastic. We just have the rows of smocking. You also have the similar embellishment on the sleeves, which do provide some nice elasticity without there being any actual elastic involved. So here is a very dark example. I will um, see what I can do to zoom you in to see the detail. This is an example of what you will often find when you search online for smocking today. This is a modern blouse. It does not have a manufacturer's tag, but I purchased this on Poshmark. It's a polyester blend fabric, very modern, but lovely nonetheless. Okay, all right. So now you can see that in actuality, the pattern that you're seeing is not because the threads are put through the pleats, but rather that the decorative threads have been woven in and out of the gathering threads themselves. 
So when you look on the back of this fabric, you can see this chain stitch and it's stitch and elastic th of the thread that gives this, um, the stretchiness and the rebound of it. And then the decorative parts are literally woven in and out of these threads. And that's what gives it that effect. Now, an interesting point, I actually have found a instructions for a similar technique in a 1920s guide for women making their own clothes. So this is not necessarily, depending on how strict you wanna be in your definition of historic, this is not necessarily um, historically inaccurate, <laughs> depending on what era you're going for. Um, if you wanted to recreate a 1880s Liberty blouse, I don't know that I would consider this technique authentic, but if you're trying to recreate a 1930s uh, decorative peasant style blouse, this could be perfectly accurate. You know, it just depends on, on what works for you. But just to be aware, searching online for clothing um, and you use the keyword smocking, this is a very common example of what will get described as smocking today. The other most common example of the modern use of the word smocking is this just very basic cotton sundress that I have owned for years. And again, just like with the last uh, black blouse we saw, it is just this use of a kind of elasticized chain stitch to provide the gathering of this fabric in into um, the smaller area. This is often you'll see um, this called shirring or ruching or um, smocking and you'll see this on waistlines and insets of sundresses. So our first historical example is from 1520. This is the dress of Mary of Habsburg or uh, uh, Mary of Burgundy, uh, she's sometimes referred to. And specifically what I want to look at is the hemmed, I hope I said that correctly, that she's wearing underneath her overdress. It's, it's a, I think, a correctly to say a shift-like garment. Um, this is not an area of fashion that I've done much research on, so um, I can't speak to um, all of the aspects of this outfit. But I do want to look closely at the at the neckline of this hem because of the way um, because of the way it's constructed. So you can see here we have the closely gathered pleats, these very vertically consistent pleats and then decorative stitching over the top. Now what I'd be really interested in doing is finding um, maybe some recreator tutorials, I know they are out there, that describe exactly how this um, over and under of the stitch work is done because it is, I think, not quite like the English smocking um, that we'll be seeing later on and um, the, the kind of smocking that I tend to do. I believe this is more of a, almost a weaving over the pleats. Um, when I was looking into some Ukrainian regional embroidery that looked very much like smocking, um, the best instructions I could find with pictures, because I can't read Ukrainian and they weren't in English, had this kind of weaving through the pleats um, instead of necessarily doing a, uh, kind of a back stitch. So I'm thinking this is something similar to that, but still very interesting and, and definitely consistent with this um, stacked pleats with stitching over the top. So now we have what is known as a smock. Um, this particular example is the earliest I could find in the Victorian Albert collection. Um, it's not necessarily the earliest anywhere, but specifically it's the earliest smock that I could find with this decorative cabling on the pleats. There are plenty of smocks. Um, smock is a word that's used very frequently to refer to any kind of um, plain overgarment or shift-like overgarment, um, but this is one of the first times I've seen it used 
with the specific pleating and cabling. Um, so here you can see this example again is from 19 or excuse me 1796. This is in the Victorian Albert Museum collection and it's just um, a fairly plain I believe it's a cotton it's got some decorative uh, kind of a jacquard or damask pattern on the shoulder pieces but then you can see there's this decorative smocking on either side of the front placket on the cuffs just above the cuffs of the sleeves to gather that fullness down into a, a, a sleeve or a, a wristband and then also a large section in the center back and this was just a way where you can have an entire width of a garment and then do a controlled shrinking of it, <laughs> of part of it into this um, pleated area, which then below it, the fabric will hang freely. Um, I believe if I remember correctly, this item, it might actually even be on display. Um, it may be too fragile for personal review, but it might be interesting at some point, if possible, to compare the depth of those pleats um, as compared to some of the more um, finer detailed pleating and smocking that we see later on in history. Here we have an example from 1840. Uh, this was an item for sale at Whitaker Auctions, and you're still able to find the images online. And I found this one very interesting because you have kind of two examples going on here. You have the control of the pleating at this fan front. And you see this fan front style even into the 1860s um, where they'll take these very kind of fine muslin fabrics and, and make into these um, these bodices that gather down very finely like you see here in the front waist. Um, so there's some parallel stitching here. And then it's harder to see what's going on in the sleeves, but there is definitely some kind of method used to ruche this fabric or create this texture and this kind of puffing, um, which I'm going to assume is a similar method. Um, to this kind of ruching or smocking that you see here. But, um, you know, without seeing the back side of the fabric, there's no way to know for sure. But there's definitely some fabric manipulation going on. And a lot of smocking really just falls into that, that kind of larger parent category of fabric manipulation. 1845, here is um, another example of this kind of fan front bodice as you see with the fabric very tightly gathered at the waistline and again in the close-up here you can see we have these parallel lines of smocking or securing um, the pleats in a very kind of regular way before the pleats are released up to create the fullness here in the bodice. Um, this is a dress that's part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art collection. And while we're here, I do, and I'm looking at the detail of this skirt, there's one thing I want to mention, and that is cartridge pleating. Cartridge pleating or gauging is another word that I've heard used to describe this kind of pleating is often seen along skirts. Um, honestly, I'm not even sure what the earliest time period is that you see cartridge pleating engaging. Um, because I just, I haven't had an opportunity to do fuller research on cartridge pleating as a waist method, but it's something you see historical costumers using a lot in, um, when they're attaching a heavy skirt, especially a very full skirt to a waistband. And again, it is just, it's, it's the same thing, y'all. <laughs> it's this process of using, um, consistently and evenly placed stitches, gathering stitches, so that when you pull them up, the fabric then creates these very vertically um, regular and vertically parallel lines of pleats or gathers. Um, and, and then they are secured in such a way. Now in this particular example, and what you often see with the cartridge pleating, is there is no smocking 
per se. There is no stitching on top of the pleat or below it. Um, instead, there is, uh, it's it pleat by pleat secured to the bodice fabric. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily even say that it's being back smocked. Um, but it's it definitely a very similar technique. Uh, you, one could say it's an adaptation of this smocking technique. And it's very interesting in one of, I think it was Morgan Donner's videos, um, she actually used her mechanical pleater to do, to run the gathering stitches for cartridge pleating on some projects she did. If I can find that video, I'll include a link below because I think it's a really wonderful example of using a newer technology to um, recreate a historical technique. All right, now we're entering my favorite era. Uh, and this is the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, which is really kind of the heyday of decorative smocking. And this is just, this is my favorite dress. Um, not, not just because I love blue. Um, I'm not a great fan of the green, but I just love this design so much. And this is this is the earliest of those kinds of artistic um, or dress reform dresses, which you're gonna see quite a few, because I think this is really when smocking and the decorative surface smocking becomes very popular and um, much, much more incorporated in especially women's fashion and high society women's fashion. So this particular dress uh, was dated between 1876 and 1882. It is in the Hull and East Writing Museum up in Hull, England. Um, if I ever have an opportunity to get up that way, I, I'm, I hopefully can see this dress. My apologies that this inset picture is, um, if it looks fuzzy for you, unfortunately, I was not able to get a higher resolution image. These images are from the um, Hall and East Writing Museum website. But um, I just wanted to try to give you some kind of zooming in so you can see the pattern here of the surface smocking. And so this is one long piece of fabric. This is almost like princess seeming fabric um, of the dress. And then you have this decorative stitching sections all the way from the bust down to the hem, controlling the overall width of this silk inset, um, which is just an amazing use of the technique um, for purely decorative purposes, really, in this case. And then within these sections, you have these diamonds and these borders. And um, I just think it's a fantastic use of texture um, and as, as well as kind of the, the physics of the garment. Of, of the fabric. So this is definitely my number one favorite example of smocking in clothing. Here is the Thornycroft dress. Um, these are pictures I took when I was at the Victorian Albert um, Study Center um, over last Christmas. So I had the opportunity to study this dress in person and um, it is a silk garment. It was made, no one's sure who made it, but it was, it was made by Sir Erz. The, the fabric was purchased from Liberty um, by Sir Haim Thornycroft for his wife. And um, he was a sculptor and they were active members of the artistic movement, um, that kind of arts and crafts scene. So you can see here the description in the Victorian Albert catalog, and this was made in 1885 and it is held in the Victorian Albert Museum collection. Um, the description reads that there is smocking on the bodice and these sleeves, um, but this is not like the example that we just saw from Hull. Um, here we have the fabric is gathered but the pleats are not as controlled. Um, there's not the uniformity in their, um, in the stitching or in the gathering. And the smocking itself is more of a utilitarian securing of the fullness, more so than anything particularly decorative. It's not done with a truly visible um, thread or anything meant to be decorative. It's just done with a single, unobtrusive thread meant to blend and simply meant to gather the fabric down. 
So this is an example. You will see the, the word smocking used in somewhat liberal ways in description of historical garments as well. Um, as smocking is this kind of general fabric manipulation, um, more so than specifically the very rigid, uh, what we call English smocking today. Here's another example um, from that same study visit. So this is a photo I took. Um, this dress, which is made of a saffron silk twill, it's really just a stunning um, piece in person. And the, the colors held up amazingly over time. This was made in 1889 or 1890, and the maker is not labeled um, that I remember. And this is just a very interesting garment as well. It's got that pigeon breast front, which you can see by the fullness of the fabric um, right in the middle section. And here again, we see the smocking as it's described, more of a manipulation of fabric than a tr specifically decorative element. So here on the left, you can see one example of um, one close-up shot of how the smocking at the top of the plastron is done to control that pigeon's breast fullness into the small area of the shoulders. And then there's also actually some decorative beadwork over the smocking that's done at the waist. This particular picture here in the middle is a close up of the waist. And it's again, it's taking the other end of that pigeon's breast fullness as it narrows down to the waist and gathering it together before it is then released out to add fullness to the skirt. Um, so that is another very interesting example of utilitarian fabric manipulation more so than the, um, the um, vertically rigid pleating. So just to put in a piece of children's wear to show that these same parallels were running um, in children's wear at the same time that you see them coming into fine women's wear. This is a girl's dress and jacket, again from the Victorian Albert. I hope you'll excuse me um, having a bias for that particular museum. It's where I first uh, established my love of historical dress, um, being a tourist there when I would visit my sister who, who lives in England. Um, but so this is a dress and jacket outfit uh, that was made in the 1890s. And you can see it's in many ways similar to the women's clothing that we're seeing in that it's got the, the smocking um, used as a way to manage the fullness at the shoulders and the waist. Um, but again, um, allowing it to blouse a bit at the mid bust and then out in the skirt. And I mean, this is not the only example of, of smocking in children's wear by any means at this time period. This is one of the earlier the ones that I found um, with, with very clear decorative smocking, which is what I wanted to highlight in this particular talk. Um, but this is just to show that this is when we really start to see it come into fine children's wear as, as well as uh, women's fashion. This is one of the iconic dresses, I think, when you're talking about the dress reform movement and arts and crafts. And I do want to, I do just want to say that sometimes you will hear artistic and aesthetic and dress reform used interchangeably or in various combinations. And um, I am not an expert in, in the history of that terminology. So what I'm going to do is include a link for you, uh, a link for you to someone who is an expert, Dr. Robin Calvert, who is in Glasgow and uh, actually did her dissertation on the Thornycroft dress, which you saw a little bit ago. Um, she was interviewed for a podcast with American Duchess 
and she actually does go into some discussion about the difference in the terms. And so um, rather than try to explain it and get it wrong, I am just going to use the word artistic um, for these purposes. And I'm going to link to those podcasts below so that you can get um, accurate information from her because I'm a librarian and it is my mission in life to connect you to the accurate information. But all that said, um, here we have just what I consider perfection because it is a combination of decorative, smocking, and Liberty & Co, which is really one of the main ways I think that we see this decorative smocking make its way into society and hire women's fashion because it was very popular and very fashionable to get your garments from Liberty of London. And so here we have a silk with a smocked, a fully smocked waistband. And you can bet your buttons, I plan on redoing, uh, recreating this dress at some point. Um, but that much smocking will definitely take time. There's also smocking at the sleeve. There's just so much fullness going on here. Um, you, you just absolutely know that this is a dress that would have been very comfortable, um, great for lounging in, um, yet at the same time looking just stunningly beautiful. So um, 1893 to 94 is the average date of this dress as well. So just a few years beyond that, we have here an example of the Liberty, another Liberty, <laughs> Love London, Liberty & Co dress. And this is a walking suit. So you have the blouse and skirt, or it may, I, honestly, I'm not sure if the skirt is separate from the blouse or if it's all connected. I haven't had an opportunity to visit this one in person. Um, this is in The Hague um, at the Art Museum of The Hague. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna refer to it as a blouse and skirt just because they're visually separated. And this I think is really fascinating because this is one of the main examples that I know of that shows a adult woman in what is called today, at least the bishop blouse or bishop neckline where it is that tightly gathered and smocked fabric in a fully circular or platter like shape uh, there's no separate um, yoke or shoulder seams this is generally a raglan style shirt um, a raglan style cut of sleeve and then it is all pleated together and smocked as one piece and so um, today <laughs> there are lots of jokes about adults wearing smock uh, bishops because we generally only see them on very young children and specifically mostly on girls um, but I think this is a fantastic example of how the style did exist for women at that time um, and Honestly, once I start, if, if I were to really dig in, I would be really curious to see if, if we could narrow down that maybe um, women wearing this style actually predated it in children's wear. There are some examples, there's some gorgeous examples of like teens sized clothes and children's you know, sized clothes um, with the bishop neckline, but um, I haven't really sat down and compared the dates on them that is for future, for sure. I gotta tell you, um, one of the things that I'm just fascinated by is why we use the word bishop for this. Um, there is no set origin of the term that I can find. As much as I've tried, I can't find it. Everyone seems to get to the point where they say, oh, and it's just, you know, it's saying it's like bishop clergy style clothing. But the reality is, um, I was able to find some historical instruction guides on making ecclesiastic robes um, for both clergy and for academics, and they don't wear necklines like this. Um, so I'm not, I, I'm still very confused about where the word bishop comes into play here. And if I ever win the lottery and uh, have the wherewithal to go back to graduate school and get my PhD in dress history, I would probably try to make my dissertation on the origin of the word bishop for this top um, and probably be very frustrated in the process. But 
that makes it all the more interesting to see when is the earliest example I can find within fashion. So now we skip forward a little bit and we've reached to the 1920s where dresses have become much looser. Um, waistlines have dropped or in some cases gone from the garment completely. And so now you see smocking used more strategically as a way to provide mild shaping to the garment without necessarily cutting um, extra seams into it or necessarily um, interrupting the vertical visual line. And so this is actually a excerpt taken from a book by Ruth Wise Spears on how to do smocking. This is uh, honeycomb smocking is, is what she's detailing. And also a guide on how to make the dots for gathering yourself. Um, I also have an example, it's very interesting book by Mary Brooks Pickens. Um, from I think 1915. Um, I'll double check that and, and if I can find it on Hottie Trust I'll link you below to that book where she also gives a guide on how and when you would use smocking and she even includes a grid, a, a printed page with this grid of dots that um, you know women at home could then kind of overlay and use as a guide um, for how they're gathering up their fabric either onto a pleating thread or for honeycomb stitching here. And so here's an example of how, how smocking was then used. So this is around, I mean, this is somewhat loosely dated, um, 1910 to 1919. I would actually assume it's later, um, maybe even to the early 20s. This was listed on firstdibs.com. So I do not know the provenance beyond its listing on this website. But I think this is a really fantastic example of how the smocking was used in that dropped ways to add just some soft gathers, some soft controlling of the fullness on this very, very sheer and very lightweight fabric. You also have smocking up here at the shoulder, which again allows you to have some shaping to the garment without darts or um, princess seams or any other kind of um, cut line. Um, it's very interesting actually when you look into this dress you can see there's they've also have a kind of a gusset if you will inserted into the side here to provide some give to the fit um, instead of just relying on the two rectangles to be able to fit around the woman's curves. And then of course this Gorgeous embroidery. And here you really see that geometric smocking. Another interesting thing to note is that the, the use of variegated thread here, both in the embroidery and in the smocking, uh, provides this kind of subtle wash, uh, this coming and going of tint among the smocking. That's not something I think that you see very often. So that about wraps it up. I said that this was brief, but maybe I should have meant brief for me. So thank you all so much for staying until the bitter end. And I hope this has given you some inspiration and some more ideas. And for those of you who are in the South with me, some more understanding of where those smocked outfits came from. So I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I hope you come back and join me again next time. Beanie, are you a good boy? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are.